Um, so our, our final talk is um, uh, going to be discussing uh, the interaction between some of these devices with other medical devices, uh, particularly cardiac uh, uh, rhythm and other devices. And so it's our pleasure to have Dr. Stephanie Jones, anesthesiologist, going to be uh, discussing that with us. Thank you very much. This is just like work. The surgeons are running behind, and somehow I'm going to get blamed for it. Thank you. All right. So I have nothing to disclose. I am, even though this talk was intended to be more general in terms of devices in the OR, I'm going to spend the entire talk talking about um, cardiac implantable electronic devices. That's the new terminology that's being used for pacemakers and defibrillators as a class. There's certainly many other implantable devices that may be present in your patients, but given the sheer numbers, um, we're going to talk again about these other heart devices. Right now, there are approximately 3 million patients floating around that have pacemakers in their body, and about 750,000 are implanted every year in the U.S. This is according to industry sources. And you have about 300,000 patients with ICDs. And, um, these are becoming more commonly implanted, and according to the Heart Rhythm Society, about 10,000 new ones are implanted per month. Obviously, some of those patients will then die off, but by about 2020, you're expecting about 670,000 ICDs in the U.S. A variety of, of um, tools in the OR can certainly cause elect electromagnetic interference. We're going to concentrate on the ones that we're talking about today. I lost a slide here. But the top three, the monopolar, both electrosurgical devices in the OR as well as in the GI suite, and radiofrequency ablation. Now, not to say that these other devices are completely harmless. As mentioned in a couple of the other talks, you can still cause harm without using radiofrequency energy. This is a cut endotracheal tube um, with a harmonic scalpel when it, with some head and neck surgery, so just, uh, you know, something that will upset your anesthesiologist in general. How can you determine whether your electromagnetic uh, device will have an effect on your cardiac device? And there's a few things that need to be addressed. One is the intensity of field or source. Again, this is going back to the other 10 lectures that we've already seen. Um, what sort of energy are you using? How much is it? Um, the frequency and waveform of the signal, this is relevant in your choice of cut versus coax versus blend. The distance between all these things. And then the orientation of the leads with respect to the field or the source. So what are we looking for in terms of adverse effects of EMI on the cardiac devices? The big one is the first one, where you're looking at either the pacemaker thinking that it's seeing cardiac signal when it's not, and consequently getting inhibited and not pacing when it should be, or for an ICD, it thinks it's seeing V-fib and shocking the patient. Neither of those are particularly desirable. You can rarely cause some unintended asynchronous pacing or some reprogramming, although this is much less common with more uh, recent devices. You can also damage the pacemaker itself. You can conduct energy through the lead and induce ventricular atrial fibrillation in your patient. And you can also cause some thermal injury at the lead tissue interface and potentially raise the pacing threshold. Again, in a pacemaker-dependent patient, that could be a serious consequence. And this is an example here um, where, um, sorry, where's the pointer? Oh, there we go, got it. Where post-op, a very large sarcoma excision, the pr threshold is elevated significantly, which again could cause a problem if this patient is highly dependent on their pacemaker signal. The other thing I want to mention is you'll notice a lot of these slides are attributed to Dr. Rosner, who will be running the hands-on workshop. He is an anesthesia pacemaker guru um, who I think will be able to demonstrate a lot of good things downstairs later. One other way of trying to determine the likelihood that your cardiac device will be affected, number of leads simply means you have more than one wire in the chest, more likely to pick up a signal. And then the distance between the anode and the cathode. The bipolar ones are actually better because the anode and cathode are both on the lead. They're both close together, kind of like a bipolar cautery. For the unipolar, the anode is actually the pacemaker box. And so you have a much longer lead, again, to pick up signal. Most of the recommendations I'm going to go through right now are based on the American Society of Anesthesiologists practice advisory. 
this is an advisory as opposed to a guideline or a standard because the evidence is actually fairly um, non-present, uh, mostly grade B at best with a lot of expert opinion mixed in. They just reissued the advisory in the February edition of anesthesiology, and you can also find it on the ASA website if you're interested. So the first things are basic. Does the patient have a device? Figure out what it is, why, why they got it, what kind is it? Hopefully they have their ID card, which would be great. If not, you can get a chest x-ray. You can actually see most of them have identifying markings that you can help determine what they are. You need to figure out if the patient's actually dependent on the pacemaker. Have they had a history of symptomatic bradycardia? Have they had an ablation of some kind? And then what does the device function? Would be great if we could interrogate all these preoperatively. As Dr. Duncan mentioned, it's not always possible to do that. You have an urgent procedure. You have an open endoscopy unit. We don't always have that luxury. This is the current codes that are used to um, describe the pacemaking devices. I'm going to talk about a couple of these. This one often gets forgotten. Rate modulation is designed so that if, if you have a patient who exercises, they will actually increase the heart rate on their pacemaker, um, and that can be affected in the OR. And then the response to sensing, as I talked about earlier, if the, car if the device thinks it's seeing native cardiac rhythm, it won't pace when it's supposed to. So the first thing to decide, do you really need to use that monopolar cautery or RFA? Can you use a bipolar? Can you use an ultrasonic if it's possible? If not, you might have something like this happen. Whoops, let me go back. So this is um, your A-line here. This is some cautery signal. This is no blood pressure. So again, generally not good. Um, some people say, okay, fine, let's just reprogram all the pacemakers to an asynchronous mode. We don't have to worry about inappropriate sensing. That's probably a good idea if somebody's completely pacemaker dependent, but you do have to worry a little bit about an R on T phenomenon. Here you have a pacer spike on a T wave, nothing happens. Here's another one, lovely VTAC induced both in your patient and potentially in your anesthesiologist. So um, again, Somebody needs the pacemaker, good to put them into asynchronous mode, but something to consider. In terms of the rate adaptive functions, you can even induce a change in the rate just by prepping the chest. These are bioimpedance monitors, which can be affected by various things um, during the operation. You do want to, as a rule, suspend your ICD antitachyrrhythmia functions. Um, the risk of the patient getting shocked is fairly high otherwise. And you always want to have defibrillation and temporary pacing equipment somewhere in the proximity if you need to use that. This is an example of the rate modulation. So a normal rate for the patient with the pacing spikes here. And then right after a uh, use of a electrocautery, speeding up to a high rate, which again um, may confound um, your monitoring in the OR and not be what you desire for the patient. The most important thing is making sure that everybody in the operative suite is aware that the patient has a device. Again, I think it's less of a problem in the operating room, potentially more of an issue in the endoscopy suite in radiology if they're having the radiofrequency ablation done down there by an interventional radiologist rather than a surgeon. But just make sure everybody in the room knows what's going on in case something adverse does happen. So should we just throw a magnet on them? That's the other um, kind of common general uh, consensus. Yes and no. For a pacemaker, frequently you'll get an asynchronous mode if that's what you're looking for, but it varies a lot by manufacturer and can even vary in an individual device depending on what the remaining battery life is in that device. That magnet is partially used as a way to demonstrate how much time you have left on the battery life. It'll purposely change its settings based on that. For an ICD, it usually does not alter the pacing function. It just takes away the antitachyrrhythmia function, which is what you want. Um, but there are a couple devices where you can actually permanently disable the shocking until it's actively reprogrammed, which would not be good to send a patient home like that. So for intraoperative, your basic monitoring would be your standard continuous EKG, although as you've seen already, that's of somewhat limited utility with um, the, during the monopolar cautery itself, you're gonna get a lot of interference. So what you want is a way to monitor a pulse, which can either be a pulse ox plasma graph or 
an arterial line, waveform. Either of those can be useful. You can also limit your use or your ability to monitor ST segment changes um, with the cautery. And you can see in the third spike what appears to be ST elevation. That is actually due to cautery. That's not real. And this is, again, a nice demonstration of oversensing where you completely lose your arterial waveform and you really can't tell up here, you know, this one looks okay and this one looks like you're getting some spikes, but you still have blood pressure, whereas here that you don't. Ways to try to help minimize the effect, um, watch where you're putting the dispersion plate. Um, depending on where your surgery is, the thigh may not be the best place. And then try to keep everything as far away as possible from the generator and leads. So if, let's say you were doing something on the upper, on the head here, um, the last thing you want to do is having the current go directly through the generator and lead system to a dispersion electrode. So you'd want it up here somewhere. The other thing is to try not to arc, and that can be through a variety of means. As described earlier, the resident holding the tool, you know, several millimeters from the actual um, place where you're trying to cauterize. Cauter uh, using a secondary tool, boving, I shouldn't say boving, sorry, I know, it's like swearing here. Um, applying the cautery to a forceps um, at, you know, to, at, to conduct the, um, the energy. Don't do that in a patient with a cardiac device in place because um, it actually demodulates the current and can tend to um, uh, get past the normal filtering devices that are present in the cardiac devices. You want to use short intermittent bursts as much as possible so that if there is an effect, it would hopefully minimize that. You want to use cut preferentially over coag. I know that's not optimal, um, but again, that nice small waveform, continuous waveform is actually better handled by the devices than these bursts of high amplitude energy that are put out by the coagulation settings. And you want to use the lowest feasible energy levels. Same principles for radiofrequency ablation. Avoid contact between the generator and leads as much with the um, radiofrequency device as much as possible and try to keep everything out of the current path. Now the kicker with RFA is that often these patients are selected to have the ablation rather than surgery because they're sick. Consequently, more likely they're going to have a device somewhere in their body. So something to keep in mind as well. Um, there was a recent publication from the radiologist showing that out of 22 treatments, of which seven were microwaves, so that's actually semi-irrelevant, but um, the remaining were radiofrequency. Two of them, one reprogrammed the pacemaker and one had some inhibition, although it was not felt to be clinically significant. So you can have some effect with RFA. And then the GI suite, think about the proximity to the devices. And I threw in this picture of a transesophageal echo. Look where that probe is. This is your halo. I mean, you're basically in the exact same plane, just proximal to the heart. So um, again, the halo is a uh, bipolar device, so somewhat less concerning. The Strata is a nice big monopolar device. So again, think about where you're working and the fact that you can definitely have an effect if you're not careful. Postoperatively, this is where I think it is really important to get the cardiologist or device um, tech involved because you don't want to be sending somebody home with a device that no longer works as it was supposed to. Um, you can get away with doing a lot of things in the intraoperative period. You're being the patient's being actively monitored. Um, we can intervene if we need to, but once they get home, we can't really do anything. So you do want to try to have the device reinterrogated if at all possible, um, and uh, you might even want to wait a day, but if they're in house, so just to make sure that everything's working okay and that all the functions have been restored to their baseline values. Now, opinions on how detail-oriented to be on taking care of patients with pacemakers does differ in the literature. One recent, fairly recent paper out of Hopkins looked at 92 patients, saw that one patient had their ICD trip into an elective replacement indicator, and based on these 92 patients, the authors basically said, now it's fine, you don't really need to do much. Um, 
they came up with this very big graph that again, all for the most part comes down to, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, I tend to disagree, I think, given the um, safety mechanisms that are in the current devices, you're not going to see a whole lot of um, problems, but they do potentially still exist. Um, the one thing they did agree on, again, is having somebody check afterwards, which, again, I'm trying to emphasize because we don't want to send somebody home with a device that's not working. So the take-home messages here, make sure you know if your patient has a device, know as much details about it as is possible. Is it an ICD or a pacemaker? Plan, do you actually need your electrosurgical device? Can you use an alternative? Be careful where your nurse or whoever is putting the dispersion pad and be thoughtful about your choice of mode if you have to use a monopolar device. Examine the device postoperatively and then maintain awareness of cardiac devices in the non-OR locations where though they might kind of slip through unnoticed. Thank you.